It was without a doubt the longest period of terror that I've ever experienced in my flying career. I am a high risk kind of human being. I love, I've always loved risk and danger. But the following four hours were some of the most terrifying hours of my life. These little planes are designed to fly in conditions like that. But you know, you can't do a trip like this without pushing the boundaries a little bit. So we had to push, and push we did. Mike started flying 12 years before me, and he was a kind of aviation hero in this country by the time that I met him, because he was the first ever South African aviation world champion. He's done some of the most substantial adventures in light aircraft that there are to do, and he's famous for it. He and Olivia Aubert flew from South America to South Africa in a weight shift microlight in a trike. It was an unusual route because you can't fly a weight shift trike across the Atlantic Ocean. So what they did is they started in Argentina, flew up across South America, across Central America, across the States, up into Canada. They then did the longest flight ever in a weight shift microlight over the pack house in the Arctic Circle to Iceland, onto Scotland, and then they flew down through the African continent to South Africa. That was an historic trip. I mean, that was the longest anyone had ever flown in that kind of aeroplane before. What I like about James is his craziness. Are you there, Mike? Slightly panicked. I think I would tend to be the one that's a little bit more measured especially when it comes to risk. I'm sure it's safe. James tends to just push it out there a little bit much for me once in a while. And Start, getting ready, Mike. Start getting ready, he says. Right. James, I don't want to be friends with you anymore. Something like eight years ago, I guess, James came to a party at my house dressed in a skirt and um, immediately had a good connection with him and we started getting on well, we became good mates. This is not really the place, place where we kiss, is it? With me building an aircraft, I was running out of money. I also needed somebody to help me in the business. And James was looking for something to do and became business partners. And then the backrest goes down flat. And then you Aerodynamics is a difficult science. It's, it's, it's half science and half art, in fact. So when you've built an aeroplane, until you actually take off, you don't really know how the thing is going to fly. With all the science in the world, you don't really know. Eventually, after a year of design and build, we got our prototype airborne. What a fantastic moment. You know, the aeroplane flew better than Mike or I had imagined in our wildest dreams. The idea for the Around the World trip hatched one evening while we were doing test flights. Mike said, you know, this aeroplane flies so beautifully, we have to take it to Oshkosh, the world's greatest air show. But how do we get it there? You know, and the obvious way to get an aeroplane anywhere is to fly it there. Although not perhaps so obvious, because to complete this journey, we'd have to fly the longest legs ever recorded in such a small aeroplane. Like, imagine the sights we're going to see on this trip of ours, eh, Mike? Yeah. Evenings like this, you know? I had a dream about flying around the world for many years. So when the discussion came up about a uh, flight to Oshkosh, I said, let's just keep going. We did some calculations which showed that, in theory, we could modify our development prototype to the extent necessary to fly it around the world. We, we don't think there's ever been anyone who designed, built, and flew an aeroplane around the world. And here we are, only 67 days before the aeroplane's going to fly, still drawing the aeroplane that we're going to build, that we're going to fly around the world. <laughs> so, well, uh, you know, I, I always like a challenge. <laughs> I know I'm you sure do. do. <laughs> Flying around the world may have been a dream for Mike, but for me, it became more like an obsession. The plan was to complete the build of the airplane and get it in the air with enough time for proper testing before we left. 
Though we started pulling in friends to help, unexpected challenges kept on moving our first flight closer and closer to the date that we'd have to depart if we were to have any hope of making it to the Oshkosh Air Show. Our second completed wing. How many days to flying, James? One month to go. So we leave. And hopefully nine days until we fly. I think we're good. I like it that we're optimists. Because as an optimist, you tend to do more with your life. We then built the entire fuselage, the tail, undercarriage, all the wiring, instrumentation, and everything else in the last few weeks before we left. Mark Simafanti's wife. Yeah. It's 4.41 a.m. There's not a lot of sleeping going on. With the Oshkosh Air Show just two weeks away, we brought in a friend of ours. For a Darth Vader suit. <laughs> John is the kind of guy that can build just about anything he sets his mind to. I do development stuff, make things with my hands and then take stuff from concept to reality. So I was able to help them quickly get the plane ready. We literally worked day and night. Eventually, myself and my dog would just sleep in the hangar. Because it was such a rush, we hadn't actually been able to test fly the round the world plane to the extent that we ought to have even to the extent that we were required by law to have. What I'm doing here is I'm signing my will before we go, just in case things go wrong. Would you witness it for me, Mike? You haven't left me anything, James. I've left you absolutely nothing. Yeah? But, you know, in fact, my estate's going to be suing your estate. <laughs> <laughs> I've subsequently become aware that this trip could have been a nightmare for Mike because he was flying with a guy who, who wanted to fly around the world badly. And if I had to take some chances to fly around the world, I wasn't about to blink. Mike confided in me and he said his, his biggest concern with James was just that he was a bit too gung-ho and would go off. He'd fly into anything. Yeah! Other people have also said to me that uh, Mike Blythe must be a very brave person, you know, not to uh, fly around the world, but to fly around the world with me. <laughs> Didn't want to die. I've got a lot of things planned for the future. It's because of the weaknesses in my character that crave recognition and, and of course, those things make you make bad decisions. I went into the Civil Aviation Authority the day before we left to obtain the necessary documents. They were on our side, as it turned out, because it was an advance for South African aviation, so they wanted to give it to us. document that we need. And I remember the day they were going to leave. And we tried to put it off, put it off, because we weren't 100% ready. And that morning when Mike arrived, everyone was saying to him, OK, so you ready? And he kept saying to them, he said, you're never really ready for something like this. Tonight is our big, big, big test. It'll be the first time the plane's flown into the night. And we've never flown the aeroplane for more than two and a half hours in a single stretch. I am very... Nervous. This is the most dangerous takeoff of the trip because it will never have taken off as heavy as we will be today. <sighs> My heart is doof, 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 doof. You want to come? You want to come with me? But you don't like aeroplanes, do you? It's my darling wife, Charmaine. We've been together 21 years. So you're going to wait for me? And you're going to watch on the internet? What's it now? Tears or what? <laughs> eh? Hey? Shane, you see, this is why it's quite hard to leave. What it does do, it gives me a bloody good reason to get back and to get back alive. What is this, darling? It's a bird. It's a birdie. It's a bird. Oh. Is this, is this for Daddy to take with him? You're going to come with us, Liza, around the world. Watch out. Hello, could I find a flight plan, please? The Civil Aviation Authority would be horrified to know. OK, aircraft identification is Zulu Uniform Tango Alpha Foxtrot. That when we took off for the first long leg, the aeroplane had, in fact, never had full fuel tanks. It's called a sling. We had never taken off at max, what's called maximum all-up weight. It, it, it's a light sport aircraft. So we didn't actually know for sure whether she would take off at all. It's literally one continuous fight. We'd also never flown at night. Yes, that's right. That's a very long leg. The emergency stuff is right behind the seat, excepting the life jackets, which are right at the top of the back.
eventually that time arrived. We walked with them to the plane, they got in and last goodbyes. Here we go. It was very emotional. These guys were going off and we didn't know if we were going to see them again. Prop clear. So we climbed into the aeroplane for the first time fully loaded to attempt the longest straight line flight ever in an aeroplane as small as ours. We needn't have worried about the slings all up weight as she took off sooner than we expected. But still, it, there was a lot of tension in the beginning because we were climbing out, we were heading towards hills, we were about to cross the border, the sun was going down, both of us were monitoring the navigation and talking on the radio and we were both working, you know. In those moments, you don't have time to talk or think about things because you've got a, a serious job to do. But as the sun started setting, suddenly this moment sort of came over us that we realized we're on our way. Mike turned to me and he just shouted. Ah! And we were sitting there like two kind of school kids, just like hugging each other. There was this incredible release of being airborne, being on the trip and being away. And then it took about 10 minutes before we hit the first crisis. <laughs> We are two aboard a sling aircraft. Almost immediately, we contact the Botswana Air Traffic Control. Yeah, we were surprised when we said we were flying to Sao Tome. How long? 18 and a half hours. You know, they never heard anything like this before. But we persuaded them that we're for real. They then said, look, you are on a VFR flight plan, um, which is a visual flight risk flight plan, which is a much simpler planning arrangement. And you are not entitled to fly over Botswana on a visual flight plan. So they said, look, you may not enter the country. Why well, don't we just change to uh, an IF flight plan? What do you think? For this round-the-world flight, one of the pilots had to have what's called an IFR rating, an instrument flight rating, has to be entitled to fly an aeroplane in a whiteout in bad weather when you can't see anything at all, only on instruments. Mike was working so hard that he didn't really have time to get an IFR rating. In fact, Mike had only got his night rating the day before we left. I got my IFR rating the day before that. The truth is that in my 7,000 hours and in my 700 hours of flying an aeroplane, neither of us had flown at night or by instruments before. The greater problem arose when we discovered why you have to fly over Botswana with an IA flight plan. There's so little electricity in Botswana. It is so dark that if it's an evening without a moon, which it was, you actually can't see the horizon and you're unable to fly by reference to the Earth. We learned a lot about the aircraft, these instruments. We couldn't dim them enough. It was like being in a fishbowl. We had this reflection, and so we couldn't see out at all. This was now a kind of a climax. Mike and James were on their way. We'd been working day and night for how long? And tonight we were going to party. There was a tracker on the plane which allowed you to go onto the website and see where Mike and James were. And so, all night partying, stopping every now and again and going and checking out what's happening. Cool, let's go, cool. carry on partying. We then discovered that the GPS, every six minutes or so, kept on switching off. So every time the GPS went off, the autopilot would switch off and the aeroplane would just kind of go its own direction spontaneously. We later discovered that the problem was caused by the tracker being incorrectly installed. There were so many times when the tracker would go off for a while. Uh, you, you know, we worked so much and worked so late and did things when we were really exhausted just because we had to. Then that little dot stopped for a while. I would think, Jeez. Did I tighten that arm on the thing as much as I should have? We decided right in the beginning that at all times one of us would be awake, really properly awake, while the other one was sleeping. And it was my turn, it was about three in the morning or something like that, and I was exhausted. Halfway through the night, I was sleeping, and the GPS switched off, switching the autopilot off. And Mike, as it turns out, was also napping. In my sleep, I felt something strange. I kind of felt something shift. 
I opened my eyes and the first thing I saw was that the artificial horizon on this instrument wasn't flat as it should have been, but it was lying vertically. We were essentially in a spiral dive towards the ground. The 20 hour days and all nighters that led up to our departure had taken their toll. Oh. It was a lesson for us on how quickly things can go wrong in a light aircraft if you lose your concentration. It's our first morning, first sunrise. Anyway, we've been starving and we have four hours to go and we have a sandwich, so... I'll swap it. No. <laughs> We're in Central Africa. <laughs> oh, our quest had generated much interest, both at home and internationally. So one of the first things that we needed to do on all our stops was update our website. If you're looking for the perfect place to ease off after months of minimum sleep and maximum tension, then Sartoma is it. It was so relaxed that we never even had a shower of passports. It had been the epitome of friendly Africa and it put us in a very positive frame of mind. Conakry would change all of that before we even got out of the plane. Are you hungry? Mm. I'm in the whole morning in the police station. I'm going to eat. And I've used some energy and like emotional energy as well. I was angry. I was so fucking angry. The previous evening, things seemed a bit tense at the airport, but we didn't find out why until after dark, when we walked out into the city in search of some nightlife. Mohammed is trying to give us a hard time and trying to be our guide, but we don't want Mohammed as a guide. You're no good guy. Turns out there'd recently been a military coup in Guinea, and we'd walked into a state of virtual civil war. Two white guys carrying a video camera, not the smartest move. Are you worried about being attacked? No, I'm not worried. We come from the most violent city in the world, Johannesburg. We were probably too quite well in the fight. We were arrested and spent the night and the following morning at police headquarters being interrogated as suspected spies. But underneath, when they suddenly like help at the end, they shake your hand, just might give you a hug. Like everything's all right, you know? But, I mean, it's could have gone the other way. It's just going to be so nasty. And yet we'll take off and get a result tonight, you know? 25 hours in an air. It's gone. <laughs> You can't really travel through West Africa mm. without having this kind of hassle at least once. And I expect we might have a little bit more hassle at the airport when we try and leave. After our night in jail, we just wanted to get the hell out of there. But we couldn't find any fuel. We heard that they had Avgas, the high-octane aviation fuel, which would have been perfect for the record-breaking flight we were about to embark on. I walked around the back to where the fuel bowsers were. I could find nobody there. Nobody. On my walk back to the plane, I walked past this guy who was sitting in the shade of having a cigarette, and I asked him, I'm looking for fuel containers. You know, I want to go to the fuel station, I want to get fuel. And he said, he's got some containers. I walked with him into this field and we stopped there and he started to move some soil out the way and out of this, in a hole in the ground, came out four fuel containers. We cleaned them as best we could with water to get the sand out and we then started this lift club backwards and forwards in a borrowed car to the local petrol station and all we could find was leaded, low quality, 93 octane fuel. It was disgusting stuff. It had these huge, like, I don't know what it was in the bottom. It, like, like somebody had got sick in there or something, you know. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Do we have water on board? With our next landfall 4,000 kilometres away, 
This didn't inspire much confidence. I still didn't copy that. Uh, which equipment? Fuel quality wasn't our only worry. Our GPS and autopilot were quirky, the tracker was malfunctioning, and then there was the radio. Uh, we do not have a high-frequency radio. No, we do not. Because an HF radio that can send and receive over long distances is both expensive and heavy, we decided not to bother with one. All we had was a line-of-sight VHF radio. We knew that we'd have 40 minutes of radio communication out and 40 minutes into Belém at the other side of the Atlantic and 22 hours of silence in between if there was no wind. With a tailwind, less. With a headwind, we wouldn't make it. <laughs> so, James, uh, with the Atlantic crossing, it looks like you are going to get a slight headwind for the first four hours. They didn't have a support crew. They had Tim, a very close friend of James. He's also competent in, in many aspects of management, so if anything was to go wrong, Tim would be the man. He was also the kind of weather station, so if it was something doubtful about weather, he would get as much information, speak to them, and they would make a decision on that. But, you know, James, um... Winds aren't your only concern here. Oh, another lightning yeah. strike. Okay, you can see the lightning strikes there. And the reason why you're seeing that is because of that. And those big tall things are called Charlie Bravos. They mean lightning, and they mean wind, and they mean death. We'd been warned about the higher currents of electrical storms in the tropics. Storms like these had been known to bring down planes much larger than ours. So as long as we're hitting like this, we're going straight past the edge of it. Yeah. Thank God we've got off before dark. In fact, an Airbus had been lost in this very region over the Atlantic not so many months back. Considering what we were up against, as pilots, we should never have attempted the crossing. But as adventurers, come what may, we were going to do it. Quite full of pathos at this time of the day, isn't it, eh? Yeah. And it's been a long day, eh, Mike? I mean, we slept like four hours last night. We spent a lot of time fighting with the police in Conakry. Yeah. We have just taken off for the longest light sport aircraft flight ever in the history of mankind. We're alone, we're above the ocean. And so here we are. At sunset, the enormity of what we were attempting finally sank in. We were less than three hours into our flight with more than 20 to go. If we had a problem, there would be nowhere for us to land, except in the cold Atlantic. We started feeling very alone. I began to feel the need to at least make an attempt to raise somebody on the radio. Nothing at all. You know what we should do? We should try and get hold of an airline and James. You know something, Mike? Why? What we could do was communicate with other aircraft within a few hundred kilometers as our route would intersect with the flight paths of intercontinental airliners. James thought it was a waste of time. The thing is, if we're starting to have a problem in the middle of the ocean, who do we call? If you yeah. haven't got at least a chat frequency for the airliners. I don't think it's a good idea. Oh, don't you want to yeah, check that? No, 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 Any airliner that can read me, a Zulu uniform Tango Alpha Foxtrot. completely on our own. If something went wrong, our only hope was our friends back home, following that tiny blip across the screen. Although there was a long night ahead, I was feeling pretty relaxed. I mean, we'd only had a couple of minor problems. The plane had basically proven it could handle these long flights. But a few hours later, it began to turn into a nightmare. At first, we thought it was just another small glitch. But as the hours went by, we weren't so sure anymore. Do we start a panic? Do we go into the initial stage of search and rescue? And things go through your mind. You think, is that that? Is that the end of this picture? 
I mean, it was difficult not to think the worst. Thanks very much indeed. OK, I'll let everyone know. Thank you. Again. It's such a good feeling. We can only be relaxed. Thank you. We have the total freedom to do what we want to do. I mean, how brilliant is that? Firstly, there was the immense sense of relief that the sling had proven itself capable of helping us realize our dreams. On top of this came the indescribable sense of freedom. The truth is, we had no ground crews waiting for us, no hotel bookings, and but for Oshkosh, no commitments to be anywhere at any particular time. We felt as though we could just hop into the plane and fly anywhere in the world. Our next destination, for instance, was supposed to be Georgetown in Guyana, but our Brazilian friends told us it would be a bureaucratic nightmare landing there. So we changed our course to the US Virgin Islands instead. We kind of liked the sound of that. Another great pleasure was to bump into aviators in these different locations. In the Virgin Islands, for instance, we encountered some guys restoring an old Beach 18. It was the first time they ran those engines in 20 years. Those things are noisy, eh? It's 5.30. We slept for about five hours. Today we're going to arrive at Oshkosh is the weather good, eh? I need more sleep. Yeah. So, Don, how is it that we landed up staying with you last night? Yeah, that's right, because... Uh... We wanted you to not have to go to a hotel or something and uh, see Florida. So and what happened is when we landed yesterday at Fort Pierce, there was a South African flag and American flag on the runway, and there was Don and Susan to meet us. Unexpected by us, of course, completely. And they said, listen, take off behind us and follow us in our Cirrus to a little airfield near our home. Don and Sue were really good to us. They were both pilots. And they'd been following us on our website. Don, were you not worried about taking us into that storm yesterday? Uh, well, of course, it wasn't there when we took off at Port Pierce, you know, <laughs> so it, they pop up real fast, so they're just thousands of thunderstorms usually every day all across Florida. You've you got to fly through thunderstorms, can, that's one of the things well, you, you got to dodge them. You, you don't want to fly through them. So we, uh, we got but, a bit uh, of dodging to do. we got to a do. bit of dodging to do right. today, and we got a long way to go today, so we better go. Let's go. When you arrive at Oshkosh in an aeroplane, unlike any other airport in the world, you don't speak back to air traffic control because it doubles, obviously, the amount of talk on the radio. There's an aircraft. I can see it. There's another one at 1800. So what we can do is get him behind those two guys. Yeah, there's a third one behind him as well. From a distance out of Oshkosh, they've got a bunch of air traffic controllers on sun chairs, lying back, looking upwards, and these guys talk to you, and you need to identify yourselves, if necessary, by waggling your wing. <laughs> You fly in, lining up behind other aeroplanes. You line up for the runway. And discover that the runway has got four dots on it, huge, big, colourful circles. 
purple, yellow, pink, blue. I mean, purple, yellow, pink, blue. And they'll say to you, yellow RV, land on the purple dot. And then the airplane behind you, Cessna 182, land on the brown dot. So effectively, you're landing simultaneously on the same runway with four other aircraft. Now, something that I don't think you would ever do anywhere else in the world, except America. There's two low wings ahead of you here, uh, number three right now. Plan to land short for now, but I will need you to high speed taxi as soon as you get down the runway. Everybody's doing good. We appreciate your help, and uh, just keep it flying. The minute you hit the tire, you put on the brakes, and then you duck off the runway as quickly as you can. The organizers had heard about our trip, and they had given us a place of honor right at the center of the Oshkosh show. I saw that we were going to taxi right past Richard Branson's version Galactic Mothership with the Airbus A380 on the other side. So we were given this incredible kind of pride of place, this tiny little yellow aeroplane. air show. It's the busiest aerodrome in the world, busier than Heathrow for the seven-day period of Oshkosh. 10,000 American families arrive at the air show in their own aircraft. They park the aircraft in a field and they camp underneath the wing. If you ever go to Oshkosh, you want to fly in. It's a different experience. It's just the most wonderful feeling to arrive at this incredible event. It's kind of celebration of aviation. This was the longest stop in our quest to get around the world, but it seemed no sooner had we arrived than it was time to leave again. And Tangle Alpha Foxtrot, I was just curious, uh, how many hours flight time is that to get home for you? Uh, that's about another 130 hours. All right, well, will you guys have a safe flight home? We hope to see you next year. Thanks very much, Will. Thanks a lot. Cheers. With the sling, and especially her crossing of the Atlantic, had impressed the crowds, but not nearly so much as she'd impressed us. We were falling more and more in love with her, more than 10,000 miles, and not a single false note from the engine. But there was plenty that could still go wrong. After all, we weren't even halfway around. When you ever see something like this, your first reaction is, oh my goodness, where is that? I don't want to be anywhere near that. We intended spending three days in Los Angeles, but what happened was there was this huge hurricane in the Pacific that was moving up from the south up towards Hawaii. Because Hurricane Felicia is a major hurricane, a Category 4, with 135 mile an hour winds. James, I'm, you, I reckon you've got to cut your stay in LA short. You've got to get out of there now. If you leave it too late, you're in Felicia's path will intersect. And it's going to die eventually over Hawaii, so we want to get out before that dies. Eh? Yeah, but by then it won't be a hurricane, but it'll still be a really violent storm. So ideally you want to get to Hawaii and get out of Hawaii by Monday morning, which means we must leave today. It just never ends, OK? Yeah, that's about right. Cool. I got to. Good luck, James. Thanks, but just pass. So we had to make a decision. Do we, do we wait for the hurricane to pass? So that is Hurricane Felicia. Or do we try and get across to Hawaii before it? Right now we're at 11 a.m. Thursday, and our route runs us in about like that, I would say. This thing is turning this way. So I reckon if we just divert it a little bit south like that, and then like the, get a slingshot around the moon. So people did say to us, listen, you know, if you really think you're not going to make it, the further south you go, you may pick up the sling tail of Hurricane Felicia. We get a slingshot. Wah! We're into Hawaii at 220 knots. to have a beer. Yeah. Why is it a never-ending search for beer? Music and beer. Yeah, there it is. And girls. Uh, Cafe you got girls. No, I didn't go for girls. Oh, no. I'm married. I feel as if I'm drinking more booze on this trip than I normally do, and I know the reason is because at 
the end of a flight, I feel like I've earned it, you know? We worked so hard, you've got to focus on the airplane. And, and it so, takes the edge off. It takes the edge off, yeah. We need to take the edge off after a long flight. You're allowed to take the edge off if you're living on the edge yeah. the rest of the time, yeah? You can take it off after a while. I'm having a really good time now. Mm. But I'm missing my family. Are you? Yeah. I've never had that before. The first time in my life, I go adventure, and I'm kind of thinking of home as well, you know? I realised that our position on Maui Island was through the centre of the earth almost opposite our home back in South Africa. In fact, the point exactly under which we were sitting is a place called Kubu Island in Botswana on the Soa Salt Pan, one of my favourite places in the whole world. Kubu is the most peaceful place that I've encountered in my travels. Thinking about it from the exact opposite side of the planet made me feel quite emotional. I mean, this was after all the farthest place that I could get from home. But rather than feeling homesick, I was energized by the fact that in our little plane, Mike and I seemed to have the world at our fingertips. And I felt excited about the next leg of our journey across the Pacific. It was a part of the world that neither Mike or I had ever seen before. All the flying over the Pacific was a dead still sea. I could imagine you know what it must be like to be a sailor where you don't have your own power in early days and you are just inching your way across this absolutely massive expanse of the earth. You know, it's a third or more of the total circumference of the earth. The other thing over the Pacific Ocean is that islands, you know, these desert islands of your dreams. They're not 10 or 20 or 50. There are thousands of these islands and they have the most magnificent pearl white or golden beaches you can see where the reef runs and this azure or aquamarine blue and nobody there, just nobody. And you think, damn, if I had floats on this plane, I would land and spend a week here. But it's so inaccessible that you really can't get there, I suppose, unless you have a lot of money. Majuro is the capital of the Marshall Islands, which is ranked as the world's most endangered nation due to flooding from climate change. As we flew in, we could see why. Hi, my name is Britain. Yakwe, Yakwe is so welcome. Thank welcome. You. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm in another place. I feel like I'm in another planet. <laughs> really? I've never, I've just never been in a place like this. Here we are driving along, and if I look through the palms on the left, I can see the beach. And if I look through the palms on the right, I can see the beach. And that's the full extent of it, you know? It is very exotic. I mean, it feels very, very far away from home. One of the nice things about a trip like this is that if you are on the go and you're on your own, you are inherently free of a whole lot of the constraints of your own everyday life and the everyday life of people in the world. We're at Mile 17 Beach. It's the end of the, right at the end of the island. It's the end of the island. It looks like the end of the world, actually. Yeah? There's nobody here. And, of course, you become more and more engaged in that feeling until it was quite nice to strip off naked and run up and on the beach and to feel free of the constraints of the places where we were. On these long flights, we'd listen out for airliners and report our position to them to relay to air traffic controllers in case we ran into trouble and disappeared off the map. Often the pilots were intrigued by us being out there in such a small piston engine aircraft. What's the name of your airplane again? It's called a Sling. It's built in South Africa, is that correct? Yeah, we designed it and built it ourselves. All right, very good, Jenny. We won't tell everybody on board so they can see you. Uh, you know, in 1970, if you do see us, you'll definitely recognize us. We're a bright little yellow aeroplane, and we've got a huge map of the world on each of our wings. Have you inside? Coming up off your uh, left side here, we go two and a half miles behind you. Uh, there they come. Ticket. Woo, boy. Thanks for the shot, man. Woo! You look very cool. As well do you. Okay, uh, safe journey, guys. Uh, nice talking to you. <laughs> so that was cool, eh? I mean, that was a Boeing 737 coming past, giving us a little bit of a display. I mean, how often does that happen? We continued across the Pacific with a series of island hops, never spending much more than a day in each place. At each new airport, once the plane was parked and serviced, we quickly found a place to stay, 
before grabbing a few hours to do a rush tour of whichever island we were on. Chase! Uh, hello! <laughs> We were having fun, but I'd say it was feeling more and more like the return leg. Cheers, devs. Cheers, Jays. Yes. <laughs> I guess you could say we were starting to feel the pull of home. <laughs> Just uh, taking photographs that we can remember later. These incredible places that we've come to and that um, we're just kind of whipping through, literally, like blink of an island, you know? It was a constant debate between Mike and I whether to spend more time in his place or move on. The choice was always to move on. And although we did manage to grab some off time on this long crossing of the Pacific, we left ourselves very little time to relax. By the time we got to Kuala Lumpur, our energy levels were getting pretty sapped. Our visit to the city seemed to go by in a flash, almost like we were in a dream. You know, I'm a rock climber. I've slept often overnight hanging you know, on a pit on or some piece of gear or, or, on a mountain. I've seen bad weather. I've done extreme sports. The difference between this trip and some of the other things that I've done was that although I didn't feel terrified that I was going to lose my life or something was going to go wrong in the next, in the next instant, um, there was a long, slow building up of anxiety and of stress. In fact, right throughout the trip, and, and, it, and it increased because I felt it emotionally. Things go wrong in aeroplanes. The weather turns bad and you don't expect it. Or you can make a mistake. I mean, you can make a mistake. I started to feel this kind of very immediate sense of the odds are stacking up. Something I've never really felt before. And so I found myself in flight when I was getting closer to my kids. And suddenly I started caring more about getting home. Just repeating this mantra to myself, just don't fuck up, just don't fuck up, just don't fuck up. But we did fuck up, badly. It was a 14-hour flight to Colombo where we intended to spend two nights, but the pull of home was getting ever stronger. If we stayed here, we would have one and a half full days here, right? Yeah. So what we've got to do in order to achieve that is we've got to clear customs, we've got to clear immigration. Halfway there, we were discussing the pain in the arse associated with paying the landing fees, paying the approach fees, getting the weather reports, finding a place to park the aircraft. We've got to then get into town on a taxi, find a hotel. Yeah, and it's not like we're having time to go and do stuff. We're just having time just to manage the flight and the flying. The admin. One of the tougher elements of flying these long distances was not actually the flying. It was the, the admin. So my yeah. crazy idea was, let's just land in Sri Lanka at the, at the international airport, do an oil change. I'll service the engine, you go in, pay the landing fee, get a weather report, and if it looks good, let's just take off again and fly to the Seychelles. James has gone to pay landing fees. We've just landed in Sri Lanka, like less than 20 minutes ago. And um, we're waiting for a message from Tim to find out if the weather's okay for our flight to the Seychelles. Because he couldn't get hold of Tim, James checked the local forecast, which looked sort of okay. but. As he got back to the plane, it started to rain. We jumped into the plane, closed the canopy. Now we're sitting in the rain, raining outside. And we looked at each other and said, let's just go. So we took off thinking, okay, we're in this rain and the cloud for maybe 10 minutes and then we'll be out of it. But it didn't happen like that. The rain just got worse and worse until effectively we were in a tropical storm with 18 hours flying ahead of us.
Sean, how's it? How's it, Tim? I don't know if you're aware that the track is moving. Yeah, they can't be moving. No, seriously, they've just landed from Kuala Lumpur. They've been in the air for 14 hours. Are you sure? Well, either the sling's been stolen or the boys are on the move again. My, that's not good news. I think there's terrible storms south of uh, Colombo. Let me get back and I'll uh, have a look and I'll call you straight back. It's raining. Raining. On a few occasions, we shone a torch onto the wing and there were streams of water coming off the wings. I remember saying to James at one point, I don't know how long the engine can keep going ingesting all this water. We never flown the aeroplane in proper rain, sustained rain, but I don't think we ever discussed turning back. James and I hardly spoke at all. Silently, I think we just agreed. We just got to point the thing for the Seychelles and we are going to go. Terrifying. Terrifying. How's it, Tim? John, I see that James tried to call me. I don't know why I didn't hear it. It's awful. They're flying into the eye of something horrible. Eventually, water started pouring through the front of the aircraft onto my feet. All of our instruments were electronic. And if they got wet and the horizon went, we would be completely out of control, literally within about seven seconds. Everyone who puts themselves in extreme situations knows that adrenaline moment when your very life is in the balance, because that's the time you feel most alive. But this wasn't like that. This was a serious miscalculation, and we knew it. My every thought was that the next moment could well be our last, and we flew like that for four hours. The rain started to slow down, and about an hour after that, we started to see stars, and we realised we were through it. <laughs> Mike turned, you know, he turned to me, and he said to me, so how did you feel during the rainstorm? I've been very, very stressed. <laughs> I said, I'm glad about that because I was really petrified. Yeah, you know, I really don't think without good reason, Mike. I mean, I think that no sane human being would be anything but terrified. <laughs> you don't think you're stupid or terrified, you know? Uh, OK, so, no, that's better. <laughs> I'd rather be terrified than stupid. There's always this something about the sunrise. I mean, it's got a powerful, like, emotional yeah. significance for humans. I think when we lived in caves, you know, it meant... Well, I think especially after a night of terror. Yeah. You know, a normal, nice, happy night, you know, <laughs> it's a different thing. But a night of terror like we had last night. I mean, maybe when people lived in caves, like, every night was a night of terror. What do you say, James? Oh, we're good. I feel so relieved and happy and great, you know? I mean, we, this is so beautiful. It's good to be alive. <laughs> oh, my God! We'd come through what few pilots will ever have to experience. We felt that if we can get through that, we'll get home. We'll make it. These little planes are designed to fly in conditions like that. But you know, you can't do a trip like this without pushing the limits. And we knew that from the beginning. Because if you had to do everything exactly by the book, you'd never get around the world. There's no ways. So we had to push. And push we did. To see that little yellow dot coming, you know, in the distance, this dot just got bigger and bigger with a whole swarm of various aircraft around it. I'll never forget the day they came back. So here we were, flying into the same airfield we'd left 40 days and 45,000 kilometres earlier, but from exactly the opposite direction. Apart from my naked brother and a good friend, the first person to welcome us was Jean. It was great to be able to tell him and all those who'd made our dream happen that, look, our creation together we took it around in 40 days and brought it back. Alive. <laughs> 40 days is not enough time to have changed your life, but you're on such a high that somehow 
you, you, you're different. And you do take a while to get back into the routine. After a great event, there can often be a great sense of deflation and loss, you know, that it's over. And I did not feel that at all after this journey. I felt a deep sense of faith in the future. And that actually bears, I think, some reflection, really. You know, why on this occasion didn't I feel I have to go and do more or do it again or do something else? One of the reasons was because I had children and a family back home that provided me a real sense of meaning. And then the other reason was we had another mission immediately, in fact, facing us that has turned out to be, I think, in many ways, a greater mission. And that is to create the business out of these aircraft and turn it into a success, not only for ourselves, but for the community in which we lived and the country in which we live. A country which is a fragile, young, adolescent country, but one which, if you are a citizen of it, you want to contribute to.